Good morning, church. Good morning again. Well, my name is Patricia. Um, welcome to Chapel Oaks. If you're visiting with us for the first time or second time, we're really glad to have you here. Um, just a quick announcement. Um, how, many people, how many people know about Cantata? Every year it happens on which holiday? Christmas. So Cantata rehearsal is going to start next Sabbath, um, next Saturday, September 7th um, at 1.30 p.m. We are needing a lot of participation this year. There's going to be a lot of kids and it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, the theme this year is going to be the king. Um, it's, a very, it's going to be very beautiful, and it ends in a really nice hallelujah chorus. So if you sing or love to sing or just love music in general, please uh, be here next week at 1.30 so we can get the group going together. Whether you've been part of the choir or not, even for visitors, if you're interested in coming just to see what it's about, you're welcome to come check it out. Uh, we're going to start our morning um, worship service with the praise team. Uh, we invite you to sing with us. We're going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy. Please stand for our first um, song.
land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Saturday. Um, it is a hymn that most of us are familiar with, but it has a little song in it that's not part of a hymn. And I remember saying this last Sabbath, I used to wonder why, okay, I'm listening to this hymn and then I'm like, oh, they threw something in there. And it's so different, but it's not because the hymn wasn't good enough, not to add to it or not to take away from it, but it's just saying what the hymn is saying in different words so it catches you you start to listen to what the hymn is actually saying you're like oh my goodness that's what it's all about because sometimes when you memorize something like i do you can just sing it and sing it and sing it and words don't you know it's memorized <laughs> you know you just sing the words and they probably don't mean something each time but when something different is in there like oh you pay attention to it so i taught it last week i'm going to do the same thing we did last week um just call and response is that okay so we get familiar with the little small new part in the song. Is that all right? Okay. Um, the you set me free. Part. Okay, so it goes like this, and you'll repeat after me with the phrasing. You set me free. You, you set, set me free. free. My ransom so free. 
through you sing with us with the praise team you set me free you set me free my ransom so free From the beginning, I will sing of my Redeemer.
the Son sets free is free indeed. Um, in everything we go through, um, every trial, every temptation, um, every tough time or good times, sometimes all we have to do is just turn our eyes towards Jesus. Because there are times when nothing will do it. A good word from a friend won't do it. Um, sometimes what you read in the Bible, you know, there are times when it gets to you, it speaks to you. But there are times when you're just speechless. And he says, just turn to me. This song just says, just turn your eyes on Jesus. May this carry you through the week. Whatever you go through, take a minute or two to just turn upon Jesus and let everything else just grow down in the light of his glory and grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can look to you as our true north. As this world has its clamor, as the seas and the waves are roaring, Lord, we can look to you and we can recognize your voice in the word. We can recognize your voice in a small, still voice in our hearts. So we give you thanks, Lord, for that measure of faith that you've given us. And dear Heavenly Father, we ask you for an even greater measure of faith in this Sabbath hour to help us to hear what you have to say to us through the message. Thank you for hearing us and being with us this beautiful Sabbath day. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many in here have ever, at least one time in your life, had uh, str str struggled with money, not having enough? How many have ever had that, what's that country music song, there's two months left, too much month left after the end of the money? So my wife and I were in college. We've been good friends for a while. I'm going to tell the shortened version of this, Becky. But um, we were... Um, and I thought after being good friends that we ought to, we, I, I want to date her. In fact, I thought this would be this, I'd really like to, to marry this woman. And so I asked her out and she said no, and I asked her out and she said no, and I asked her out and she said no. Now those of you who know both of us probably think she had a really good reason for all that, right? But um, after the 13th time of saying no, I said, what's the deal? You know, we have the same ideals, we have the same, you know, the same things we want in life, the same standards, the same, we, you know, we love God, we both want to, we want to teach together and have in schools, we want to, what's the deal? And she said, 
because the way your family handles money is not compatible with the way my family handles money. My dad was, uh, my dad paid for the farm early. He doesn't do debt. He pays for the seed. His, her dad was a farmer, pays for the seed um, every year in cash, pays for the fertilizer in cash, buys his tractors with cash. Your parents don't do that. They're pretty far in debt, so no. Wow. So that was Dave Ramsey before Dave Ramsey. Um, and I, and so, being that I liked her more than I liked my parents being in debt all the time, I said, we'll do it your way, dear. And she said, okay, I'll go out with you. So um, three months later, we were engaged, and uh, eight, nine months later, I think we were married. Uh, so um, from the beginning, I was fortunate to be married to somebody who always thought it was important to have a margin. And I will tell you, when we were in college, there was very little margin. First Christmas together, we got ready to do Christmas shopping, and we looked at our bank account. We were, we were both at Andrews. We were paying tuition, and we were doing all the, you know, trying to, and, and working part-time, trying to pay all that, because her dad wasn't supporting her in college, and my parents weren't supporting me, so we were basically making our own way. And she said, um, we said, well, let's do Christmas shopping, and we looked at the banking bank account, and there was zero in the checking account, enough to pay for this next quarter's tuition, but after that, and rent and food, that was it, no, no money at all. And so I said, what are we going to do? And, and we said, well, I guess we're not going to have Christmas. So we actually went out in the woods and cut a little Christmas tree and put it on our, on our counter, and that was going to be Christmas. Fortunately, her dad came to visit us and brought us a bunch of food and stuff and said, hey, Dennis, how are you doing for Christmas money? And I'm like take care of your daughter. Oh, we're fine. And he said, well, in case things are a little tight, here's, so he gave us a, a, gave me an envelope with $51 bills in it. And that was maybe the neatest Christmas we had together. But that was the margin, was $50. That's how little there was between no money at all and, and you know, it, and, and disaster. So I was fortunate to live with Becky our whole life and, and, and not ever, not ever did debt except, except to buy a house. Everybody's not fortunate enough to get to be able to, to be able to have somebody manage their finances like Becky is, and and the world lives with very little margin, and most of us don't have much margin, whether it's money between a, a margin of money or a margin of time or a margin of effort or a margin of whatever we have, emotional um, um, emotions uh, 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 in our tank. Um, our margins are very thin, and I think thinner and thinner today. We, especially if you look at, you know, especially social media doesn't help, right? Because you look at you look at your friends' Instagram or Facebook paid postings, right? And they're all about their cool vacations that they went to, where to this place, and they're skiing in Vail, and they're going to the, you know, Bermuda on vacation. And you think, wow, I'm just doing normal stuff, you know. We go to worlds of fun, and we got a, you know, a big deal is to go to Branson, but our friends are all doing these cool stuff. Our, our lives must not be very cool because compared with them. And so the lack of margin gets us into more and more trouble. And then if we have a disaster, as Dave Ramsey will say, you know, with Murphy's Law, if, it, if something can go wrong, it will, Mr. Murphy shows up. And when Miss, Mr. Murphy usually shows up when there's no margin, and then it turns into a disaster. Well, we have an answer for that. We are going to be doing Financial Peace University as part of a, an effort of 100 churches in Kansas City starting on September 14th and 15th on that weekend. Um, we will be having some Financial Peace University classes here on Sabbath morning and one on Sunday morning. And the cost for this is $95 and it will be the single best $95 you will ever invest ever invest in your life. I will guarantee you that your return on investment in this will, will, will pay you dividends, not only financially, but in how you discuss money with your spouse, about how you discuss money with, with, um, with you know, if, if you have a roommate, if you have, how you discuss money with your family, how you, how you manage your time, how you manage your priorities. All these things are talked about in Financial Peace University. So if you haven't been through FPU, you gotta sign up. 
If you've already been through FPU in the last year, you get to come free. But if you haven't been a part of it, invest that $95 in, in it. You know, if you're young, if you're in, if you're in college or if, you know, and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to, you know, end up with, with, you know, $75,000 worth of debt, college debt, how am I going to do that? Come to FPU. You'll learn how to do that without that kind of debt. Um, it will change your life for the better. <clears throat> also invite a friend, invite a neighbor. If you have a, want a reason to invite somebody here to Chapel Oaks, invite them to come to Margin. Um, you, there's a lot of information at the table out back. Um, <clears throat> um, and Tyson will be out at the table after service, and there's brochures and these, these cool little cards which talk about slaying the margin monster, how to get more margin in your life. So please think about um, this, and we start in two weeks. So um, please make sure that you have a chance to take a look at this information. It truly will change your life for the better and the life of our whole congregation. Our scripture today is Micah 5, verse 7. Micah 5, verse 7. Then the remnant left in Israel will take their place among the nations. They will be like dew sent by the Lord, or like rain falling on the grass, which no one can hold back and no one can restrain. Feel free to join us by kneeling for prayer. Dear God, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your love, the sunshine, cooler temperatures, friends, and family. Thank you for the Sabbath. You are so good to us. Please be with all of the silent prayers, with the people who are sick or discouraged, and help us to always be true to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sorry, can you start it over? That was my bad. I wasn't ready. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah. We're good. <laughs> Amen. My heart is so proud. My mind is so unfocused. I see the things you do to me As great things I have done And now you gently break me And lovingly you take me And hold me as my father And mold me as my maker I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. There are times I may grow weak or feel a bit discouraged knowing that someone somewhere 
could do a better job for who am I to serve you I know I don't deserve you and that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down and each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace So patient with me, Lord. As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me. I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down? And each time I short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound and you answer my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace Thank you. Blessing. Let's pray one more time. Lord, simply ask that you will make me a nail on the wall, fastened securely in its place. And from this thing so common and so small, hang a bright picture of Jesus' face as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A renowned surgeon, Dr. Lewis Evans, decided to visit an old friend of his several years ago, missionary in Korea. They were colleagues, both surgeons, and Dr. Lewis was amazed as he watched his friend for seven long hours in unbearable heat, forbidding circumstances, the lack of the best equipment, and just about everything else imaginable against him, perform a surgery on a woman who had come earlier complaining, Doctor, I can't stop vomiting. There's something wrong in my stomach. Can you help me? Dr. Lewis's friend sacrificially gave himself for the good of these other people. And at the end of that surgery, the end of the day, they sat chatting, and Dr. Lewis just kind of chiding with, half a grin, it was, it was teasing, said, hey, doc, what do you get for a surgery like that? You know, back in the States, that's worth about 15,000 bucks. His friend walked over to a small drawer and pulled out the small dented copper coin, everything the woman who just experienced the surgery had in terms of money. She had given that to the doctor. And he said, first, this is the first thing I get. But he said, the second thing is priceless. For seven hours, I experienced the realization that Jesus, the living Christ, is ministering to broken, needy people through these fingers. That's the gospel. And that, my friend, is what Jesus Christ is calling you for, to serve unselfishly. 
sacrificially in the interest of other people's good and God's glory and not your own. Are you hearing Jesus this morning? Me too. Me too. It is our privilege to personally touch people's lives for Christ. It's too easy to rest in the knowledge that we're part of a great organization that is worldwide and millions of dollars are being spent every year to spread the gospel. Somebody's doing it. But what about you? What about you? There are people, individuals, that God loves dearly. And it may be you that are the very, no, it is you, the very one that God would choose to use to open the heart of that person and share the gospel of Christ with them. First, by how you treat them. And second, when their heart is open to the message he's given you to bear. Notice our text this morning, Micah chapter 5, verse 7. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like a dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man nor wait for the sons of men. The remnant of Jacob describes God's people in every age. Not just at the very end. There's always been a remnant. That which remains. Listen, God wants to include everyone in his great program of salvation and eternal life. Jesus died for every person. Not a single person is left out of his plan for salvation. Do you believe that, church? Every person, right? And the Spirit is drawing every person to Jesus Christ. Okay? But Jesus put it very simply. Here's the solution to that dilemma that we find. Well, if he died for all, why can't everyone be saved? Many are called, few are chosen. There's the remnant. The remnant simply says yes to God. Yes, Lord. Your promise, I believe it. I embrace it. Your call on my life, yes, Lord. I believe it. I embrace it. I will follow. By your grace, I will follow. Amen? That's right. So this is the remnant. And the Lord says, they are in the midst of many people. Now, it's interesting to me, in the, in the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah and other places, the Bible says all people are like grass, yet the people of God are here depicted as dew or rain from the Lord. Interesting, uh, interesting words, interesting uh, metaphor, isn't it? The, all flesh are like grass, but God's people, the remnant, are like a dew from the Lord. As water gives refreshment and life to the grass, so God's people are to refresh and convey life to a dying world around them. Notice how Solomon in the Psalms describes Jesus' ministry in these words. This is prophetic. Years before it happened, the psalmist, I think this was Asap, saw this in heavenly enlightenment, in vision. In Psalm 72, verse 6, He, this is the Lord, the Lord Jesus, He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. What a beautiful privilege. You, you see, even before I unpack this more, you see what Jesus was called to do and to be, to be like rain on the grass, God's people says the prophet Micah, are like Jesus in being like rain upon the grass. Now, Jesus' work was to bring the spiritual water of life. If any man thirsts, Jesus said, let him come to me and drink. He alone can quench thirsty souls and redirect those seeking to quench their thirsty souls in all the wrong places. He alone can satisfy the spiritual thirst, right? And how did he do this? Well, according to Luke chapter 4, verse 8, we are to- verse 18, rather, we are told, the Spirit of the Lord, as he began his ministry, this is how he opened his ministry, 
This is a, the writings of the prophet Isaiah he's quoting here. But he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, to set free those who are oppressed. My friends, are there any people in our world today that have broken hearts? Are there any people in this world today that are poor, not only physically but spiritually? Are there any people in this world today that need to be set free from bondage? Yes. Is there anyone oppressed? Everywhere. Now, before you notice anything else about this passage, I want you to notice carefully with me the very first phrase. It's the most important. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. In taking human nature upon himself, listen to this unfathomable mystery. Jesus is God. I believe that, do you? He is very God in the fullest sense. Eternal. And yet at the same time, when he willingly chose to take human nature upon himself, a body hast thou prepared me, he says to the Father in the Psalms, quoted in the book of Hebrews. When he took humanity upon himself, he became as dependent upon the Holy Spirit as any other human being must be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Don't ask me to explain that mystery. I can't. I can't. I can't wrap my mind around it. And I don't know any human being that can, but that's what Scripture is telling us about our Jesus. Amen? So he knows by experience... That the Spirit comes in response to prayer. That's why we find him so often in prayer in the Gospels. We find Jesus seeking the face of his Father for the outpouring of the Spirit to bring life and salvation and restoration to lost and broken people. And it is only as the Spirit of God falls upon us as dew and rain from the Lord, that we can be as dew and rain from the Lord in the midst of many people. Do you believe that, church? Then as we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, and that is a daily experience. That is a daily experience. As we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, Jesus commissioned to us can and will be fulfilled. John chapter 20, verse 21. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Do you see the relationship between Luke chapter 4 that we just read and this message? You seeing that? Okay, so if we, number one, before I go there, if we are filled daily with his Spirit, as Dr. Lewis Evans' friend was, longing for and experiencing the Spirit of God, Jesus, working through his life and his fingers to minister to others. We are called to that same privilege. We are called to that same privilege. And when this happens, when the Spirit of the Lord has anointed us, we will be anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. We will be used by God to heal broken-hearted people. We will be proclaiming liberty to people that are stuck and in bondage to addiction and sin of every kind. And God will use us with the message of the gospel of his grace to set free those who are oppressed. And we ask for the Lord for the Spirit. We are not to wait for some compelling power to take over before we go to work for him. Not at all. It is by faith. We are to approach the Lord in his word based on his promise. We are to receive his promise and go about our lives as if the word of the Lord has been fulfilled. He has anointed me. I am prepared by the Holy Spirit to minister in Jesus' name and set about doing the very things that Jesus Christ has done. And God will bless us. And not only that, he will expand our territory. What I want you to hear me today say, friends, is our circle of influence, our circle of influence 
is the place where God wants us to go to work. Our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, our work associates, people that we do business with. It's that circle that it begins. And if we will begin in that circle and, and daily seek to pray for these people and for God to open our eyes how we can minister to these people in that circle of influence, he will do that very thing. And if we are sensitive to his voice, which is his providential workings, his impressions of the Spirit as we pray, and the scriptures, he speaks through these things, he will open our territory. He will help us to see more clearly where he is at work and where he's calling us to join him. You know, the beautiful thing is, we may, we may not get it exactly right, but if we just start doing something, it's a lot easier for God to, move a, to steer a moving vehicle, just like it is for us, than it is for one that is stationary, standing still. Now, I pretty much said everything I'm going to say today, but there's part two to this sermon, and my friend Anna Corden is going to share a testimony of how God has spoken into her life, lessons that she's learned, and what the Spirit of God does when we say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to walk with you where you're calling me. So come share with us, Anna. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Is it okay if I use this mic over here? I can't promise I'll stay stationary, so this might be a better option. When Pastor Mike asked me this morning, or earlier, I mean, when he asked me to share my testimony this morning, I started thinking and praying about, okay, what is a testimony? A testimony is evidence. A testimony is somebody standing up to testify of something that they have seen and experiment, or experienced themselves. So I started praying, okay, God, what can I share? Because I have seen you work, and let me tell you, I am happy to be here today to be able to share with you what I've seen God do. That there's evidence that there's a living, breathing God who sees and who cares. And Revelation 12 if you have your Bibles, Revelation 12, verse 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. How do we overcome the devil? By the blood of the Lamb, which God has already done. He's died on the cross for us. He overcame him, and by the word of our testimony. And my prayer is today that during this time that we have together, that the devil will flee this place, our hearts will be open, that God can speak through me, and that it will touch your heart. We serve a living, breathing God. He sees, he knows, he cares, and he is so personal to know each one of us, to know our needs, to know who we are, to know what, what we need day to day, and he wants us, and he wants a relationship with us. He desires that relationship with us, and he calls each one of us. I'm going to share today a testimony of how I've seen God work in the last couple of years. But I want to make something very clear before I begin. And that is God calls each one of us. He first calls us to a relationship with him. He wants a personal relationship with him. He's died so we could live. So he's calling each one of us to a relationship. And then in the Bible, as you go through examples of people, of Jesus calling people to a relationship with him, he then instructs them to go and to share. He calls us, he wants us, we're, in, we're with him, and then he asks us to go and share. So in the next little bit, I'm going to share with you um, of how God has been working. But before we do, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, um, today we come to you. And we just ask that you are in this place. Lord, you are so powerful. Who you are and who we are, there's nothing that compares to who you are. And we are no one, yet you see us and you care about us and you love us. And I thank you for that. I pray for each person in this room today. Lord, we all come from different things that have happened this week different experiences, different things going on in our own homes, in our own lives. But I pray in this next little bit that we spend together that our hearts can be open, that our eyes can be open to see you speak through me and help me to testify of who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm going to start off a um, All right. 
So in 2008, I went to Union College. Um, I started there my freshman year, and I decided to go into nursing school there. And that year, um, one early in the fall, they stood up at the school and they said, hey, they started talking about student missions. And they have a huge student mission program at Union College, and they are inviting anyone who would like to participate the following year to go and to talk and to sign up. Instantly, in my heart, I'm like, this is something I would love to do. All my life, I have wanted to go to Africa. And I'm like, okay, Lord, if this is a way to be able to go, I'm yours. And so I remember after that whole um, talk, I went to go find somebody, and I was telling them, like, I would really like to be a student missionary. What do I need to do? So they started walking me through the process. And one of the biggest things I remember they asked me to do was to start to research the country that I would like to go to. So there was an opening in Chad, Africa to work at a clinic there. And going into nursing school, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Then I can get experience there. Um, there were going to be a lot of kids around. And I was like, man, this is the perfect place. So they asked, like, okay, go ahead and start researching the country, write a research paper, and find out about the culture, the language, so that when you get there, you're prepared. So I'm like, okay. So I spent time writing that research paper. Let me tell you, 10 pages of research about this country, I was feeling like, all right, I'm ready. And all the verses that God talks about, like, okay, I'm calling you, I'm sending you, I felt so ready to go. And I'm like, okay, Lord, please, I can't wait. And I told the nursing program when I found out I was accepted into the program, I was like, I'm actually going to be gone next year. <clears throat> Can I start when I get back? So they deferred my acceptance, and they accepted somebody else in my place. And so the deal was set. I was going to Chad Africa. So Union, or that year at Union came to an end. And that summer, um, I was going to be staying for a three-week course of microbiology. So I remember getting out of class one day. And I got a phone call from Pastor Rich, the chaplain there, and he's like, Anna, I need to talk to you. So I'm like, okay. So I go, and I remember sitting down, and he's like, Anna, there's a lot of political issues going on in Africa right now, and, or in Chad, Africa, where you're wanting to go. They're no longer accepting student missionaries there. And um, I hate to tell you this, but the next country on your list, because we had to pick three countries, he's like, the next country on your list is actually also shut down to any student missions or student missionaries going there. And I'm like, what? So I was trying not to cry, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just listening as he's talking. And then he goes on, and he's like, and to tell you the truth, your third option to Nicaragua is also closed. They're not taking any student missions this year, or student missionaries this year, so my question is, where do you want to go? And I remember sitting there thinking, like, where do I want to go? I feel like God showed me where I was supposed to go. Like, there has to be a way to go to Africa. And so then he was like, well, just take some time to pray about it, to think about it, and let me know. So I get off the phone, and needless to say, I sat there for a good while crying and praying and asking, like, God, I thought this was it. Have I heard you wrong? What am I supposed to do? And the course that I was taking was so <laughs> made up of so much intensity that it was like, okay, I don't really have time to put, put towards this. But I remember starting to think like, okay, then I just need to pick another organization to go through. Or I need to pick some other country to go to. But I was determined that this is the plan that I was going to go to Africa. Well, again, I kept reaching closed doors and another closed door and another closed door. So the class time came to an end. I was leaving for a summer to do literature evangelism, and my ticket was set to leave on August 11th, and I had nowhere to go. So my mom, I remember talking to her after camp meeting that summer, and she's like, Anna, I talked to somebody. Um, he's from the Southern Asian Division, and he was saying that there's an opening in Nepal to teach. And I remember thinking, Nepal? I don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> Why am I? No, I don't want to go and teach. And also, I remember looking on Google, like, okay, where is Nepal? What is it about? And I'm like, Lord, I've been praying to go to Africa. I don't want to go to Asia. And that is so terrible to say, but not, truly, sitting there thinking, no, this is where you put a burden on my heart for Africa. This is where I should go. Anyways, God does things to help you draw closer to him, I believe. So it made me get on my knees, and I remember just praying, Okay, if you've asked me to go, where is it? What do you want me to do? 
So, long story short, two weeks before I was supposed to leave, it was finalized that I was going to go to Nepal. All I knew was that I was going to be going to teach and that somebody would meet me at the airport. So I got off the plane. I remember looking for a sign for Shear Memorial Hospital where I was going to be going. And I got there on August 13, 2009. And the lady tells me, she's like, you're going to be teaching. We have a school of kindergarten through fifth grade. You're going to be teaching about 70 kids English and science. You can start tomorrow. And I was like, oh, okay. Are there books? What should I do? So I went to my house or where I was going to be staying in the apartment. And that began uh, about a 10-month journey of being in a place outside of your comfort zone. Things that happen that either, well, not that either, that break you, that change you, (laughs) that rearrange you. But I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that year changed my life. And that year was exactly what I needed because it showed me a God who is so real, so personal, and so attentive to each one of us. He knows us, and that year changed my life. I loved it. I didn't want to leave when it came time. (laughs) And I remember reaching a point while I was there that year. I was sitting in or standing in my hallway in my house, and I was like, okay, Lord, if you want me to serve overseas, I'm willing to go wherever, but I would love to come back to Nepal. And I purposed in my heart, like, okay, when you get back, go finish nursing and come back. So I left Nepal. So then I went back and I started at Union um, in the fall of 2010 after that year. And I was purposed in my heart to return. I felt like God had been leading and guiding and shown or showed me time after time after time, like, this is where he's working. And that, I, I wanted to be a part of that. So nursing school came and I went through it. And in December of 2014, I graduated. So I needed to work to be able to get out of debt from school. So I decided to come here to Kansas City to work at Shawnee Mission. Let me tell you something. There is something about stubborn people that (laughs) sometimes your greatest strengths are your greatest weaknesses. And after I finished nursing school, it was like, okay, I need to go back to Nepal. This is where I need to be. This is what I'm going to be doing. So I started working at Shawnee. I was living with Elizabeth and Curtis, and they were telling me about a family that they met in the Nepali community. There are refugees here from Nepal. And it sparked my interest because they were Nepali, but it didn't move me because I'm like, that's cool that they're here, but I'm headed to Nepal, so I didn't really want to invest any time into that community. But I remember feeling like, okay, God, let me just get out of debt. As soon as I get out of debt, I'm ready to go. So I, for a year and a half, would work, sleep, work, and sleep. I remember coming to church at the last second possible because I would sleep that morning and I would leave as soon as the sermon was done because I was going to go home and sleep some more before the week started. And that was what made up my life. Not all of it. There were, <laughs> there were other things that were happening, but it was in my mind, in my heart, this is, where, this is what's going to happen. Okay, so that being said, Through that time, life happens. Health changed for me. Relationships changed. Directions that I thought, this is where I'm going, this is what's going to happen, things were changing. And throughout that time, I remember thinking, okay, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I know this is my end goal. And needless to say, as things begin to change, that kind of changes what's going to (laughs) happen. And so I remember on August 13, 2016, I reached a breaking point. And I, Elizabeth and Curtis were leaving for church that morning. I was like, no, I'm not going to go. And I went downstairs, and I broke (laughs) to every part of who I am, just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And I was like, Lord, you've put a desire in my heart. And I am wanting to be able to get out of debt with health, all these things that are happening. It's putting a stop to that. What do you want? What do you want from me? How can I live for you? And I got a phone call from a friend during this time, and he's like, Anna, why don't you come to church with me? So I was hesitating, but I decided to go that day. And in that prayer that morning, I remember specifically praying, 
Lord, I am so lonely. I don't think this is what you designed. I'm working, sleeping, like I, I have no purpose. What do you want? So when I went to church that day with my friend, he was telling me about the Nepali community here in Kansas City. And he's like, Anna, I play kids with so many of the Nepali kids here in downtown KC. You should come sometime and play. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then on the way home from church, he was like, let's go by the park, actually, where we play soccer, and I'll show you where some of the kids are. And I was like, no, not at all. Kids should not be talking to strangers. It's okay. And he's like, no, let's just go by the park and see who's there. So we go against what I was wanting to do. I couldn't leave the car. So I'm in the car, headed to the park, and thankfully there were no kids at the park. So we keep driving, and on the way back to his house, all of a sudden he sees a couple kids on a street corner, and he pulls into the parking lot. He's like, that's them. That's some of the kids I play soccer with. And he starts to push me, and he's like, go talk to them. I'm like, no, I am not getting out of this car. And he's like, Anna, just go say something to them in their language. They'll be excited. And, And he started again to push me. So I'm like, okay. So I open the door, and I remember walking over to these kids thinking, what am I doing? And I get over there, and I'm like, hi, how are you? And I start saying something in Nepali, but I couldn't really remember anything. And I felt like, well, this is weird. They don't know me, and I'm just standing here. They're probably scared. So I was like, is your mommy home? And um, they look at me, and they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, can we go meet her? And so we go to the door, and this lady opens the door, and she peeks her head out. And I could not remember anything other than the word sati, which is friend. And I was just starting to say, like, do you want to be my sati? Do you want to be my friend? And I explained how I lived in Nepal, and I was like, I would like to get to know more Nepali people. And so she invites me inside. So that day, we spent a little or a few minutes together. But they love cooking. Um, Food is really special, a part of their daily life. And so we set up a time for the next day to get together to eat and to cook. So I went home the next day. I got ready, went over there. And it ended up being eight hours. We cooked, we ate, and then they wanted to go to a relative's home. And then we went to another relative's home. And in one of the relatives' home, this lady had been um, just discharged from KU Hospital. She was sitting there. She had a big wound on her leg. And all the discharge instructions were in English. And she was, um, they were not knowing what to do. And all of a sudden, it was like, okay, well, (laughs) I know how to change a bandage. And then I can explain to them what they need to do. So I started doing that. And then we went to another home, and something else came up where it was directly something that I could help with. And it kind of was like, okay, well, I'll do this. Well, anyways, by the end of the day, it's in the evening, and I'm driving home, and I get in the car, and in 15 minutes, I'm home. And it just stopped me (laughs) because I'm like, Lord, I have been praying that you can take me overseas, and I'm not even seeing the people right in front of me. I am so sorry. And so that led me on a journey, praying, help me to see the people in front of me. So I remember later that week, I went to her home again, and there were all these papers the school had given because school was getting ready to start, and everything was in English. They didn't speak English. So it was things, practical things that I could help with. And it was a series of events that happened very quickly after that that it just was grabbed my heart. And it was like, how can I be living every day, and these people are living right here, and I'm not doing anything to help? And it really shook me. It really made me ask some questions that were hard for me to answer. Because the the thing is, God died so we could live. And the prayer in my heart has been, show me how to live. You died so I could live, show me how to live. And so that started a desire in my heart, like, okay, Lord, I'm missing something. I know you call us to things, but he mostly calls us to a relationship. And then he just asked us to start where we're at, doing what we're doing. Sometimes we wait for something we think it is, this is my passion, this is where I want to go, or this is what I love to do. But in all actuality, he just wants us to walk with him. He'll lead us, he'll guide us, and that has been the story of these last two years. So after that experience, I decided to move to the apartment complex where a lot of the families lived. It seemed crazy to me. I'm not married. I don't have kids. Every time I'm driving 15 minutes back and forth when things kept coming up where they're needing somebody there. And so in November 1, 2016, I moved to the apartment complex. 
and I got to know another family, my neighbor. She also changed my life. And from her family, you get to know another family and another family. And soon, about a month into it, things started, you start to recognize, like, wow, the, these people, their lives every day, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, there are so much, there's so many struggles. One of them being is the, is the family dynamics. When refugees come here to the United States, they're placed in our city. Why? Because there's schools right there. There's bus stations right there. There's work right there. But what happens in our city, in our cities in the United States? Filled with crime, gangs, drugs. And that's what I started seeing that first month. I've never in all of my life lived every night where ambulances are going past your window. I'm like, wow, another thing tonight. <laughs> it was shocking. And over and over, it just came to the realization, like, this is what they're seeing the first time that they get here. Not only that, they don't speak the language, so it's trying to figure out and man maneuver through all of this, make decisions for their family, and every challenge that could be there is placed in front of them. So I started praying about, like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I met a boy named Addis, and Addis, God was already working on. You see, the thing is, when God calls us, he usually calls us to where he's already working. It really has nothing to do with us because he is on the move. We serve a living, breathing God, and he's already working. And before he's called you, he's already working to where he called you. So Addis comes to me, and he's like, Anna, there's, there's so much need for youth to be a part of something. Can we start a youth group, or can we do something? Because we're getting into trouble. There's other things happening. Can we do something? So we started a youth group. It started with six people. He brought his cousins, he brought his friends, and I remember the day Elizabeth came to my apartment, and we decided, like, what would you guys like to do? Would you want to name yourselves? What, did, what group name do you want to have? And one of the boys was like, new change for youth. And so that's how it all began. So that was in February of 2017. And over the course of the last year and a half, two years, God has been leading and guiding this group of young people. In that spring, it was like, okay, there's going to be a vacation Bible school at Westland Exa this summer. Do you want to go? The invitation came for our group to go. And by that point, there were like 15 kids, and we're like, yeah, we'll come to it. So we told the kids, there's a soccer camp that's coming up this summer. Do you want to be a part of it? Yes, we'd love to. So they brought more friends. So Wes Lenexa found, or one of their church members drives a bus. He came on a bus, picked up the kids, and for a whole week, every night, took 40 kids back and forth to the soccer camp over at West Lenexa. After that, with all these kids, it was like, okay, what are we going to do? Just walk away? Like, God, provide something that we can do with him. So then somebody said, well, you should start Pathfinders. And I'm like, what? That's, I know nothing about Pathfinders. But again, when God calls you to something, he's already working. And step by step, as the group was growing, he was bringing in more people to help take the next step. And so then we met Ann Wom, who's here as a church member. She was a retired Pathfinder director for the Dakota Conference. I remember Elizabeth telling me, like, you should go and talk to Ann. I was like, absolutely not. I know nothing about Pathfinders. When I get there, what am I going to say? Let me at least read about it. Let me at least find out what you even do. And then that way I am a little bit more prepared before I talk to her. Well, God doesn't work like that. <laughs> so we're at a meeting because Jason Hansen invited me to a meeting at their house. And we get there, and Anne was there, and she pulled me aside after the meeting, and she's like, hey, I heard you're starting a Pathfinder Club. Where are you at in the process? And I'm like, well, we have the kids, and that's about it. And she's like, well, that's a great place to start. Let me give you my number, and I'll meet with you. I'm like, okay. So we met, and the first time we met, I left her house at 2 a.m. <laughs> and I left there thinking, like, Lord, you are just <laughs> so incredible. But it's so interesting because he asked us to do things that are so outside of our comfort zone, but it has nothing to do with you. He's just wanting you to say yes because he'll bring the other people to make it happen. So then Anne joined the team. Then another group of adults were like, hey, if Pathfinders is going to be there, we're going to help with it. So then more leaders came to help lead and start off that fall. So the first year we had a group of about 36, 40 um, Nepali kids that were in the Pathfinder Club. And, you know, every step of the way, there's unknown with it. Where would we meet? Would the parents allow it? What would happen? 
all of these kids, most of them are not Christian, they're Hindu or Buddhist. Is this even realistic? So we started praying through those things. And one by one, by one obstacle, God started providing at just the right time and when you need it most. We meet in a Lutheran church in the basement. They let us meet there for free. Churches from all around, the Kansas-Nebraska Conference, Iowa-Missouri Conference. Do you need Bibles? Do you need shirts? We have a trailer stocked full of supplies with camping supplies we're not using. Could you use it? Step by step, God was providing. So then we got through the first year of Pathfinders, and last summer, again, Wesley Nexus said, hey, we're having a vacation Bible school. Do you want to come? So we decided to go, and once again, the bus driver came. He brought the bus to get the kids, and night after night, for the whole week, that week, 70 kids went. And at the end of the week, we were there looking through all the kids, and all of them, majority of them were from the Congo, Uganda, Thailand, Nepal, Burma. And it was like, Lord, we have just been working with the Nepali community. God had provided a man by the name of Philip Dungle who had been studying as a pastor. And every summer he was there leading up to this point. He was there and he helped translate. He helped go to homes and talk to the families. So it's like, what are we going to do with this whole community of people? So we decided, okay, let's just pray about it. And we all decided, let's have an international club. But wouldn't you know when that decision was made, then God brought the people needed to make that happen. Paul and Angie, who speak Swahili and can speak to all the Congolese. Chen and Voom, who speak Burmese, can go to those homes. And step by step, God kept bringing the people to make that happen. So then it came time that Oshkosh was being talked about last fall. And it was like, does your club want to go to Oshkosh? Well, we don't have club dues. We don't really run it like that. We don't have really, there's no, like, here's a source of income that's coming in to help this Pathfinder Club run. It's through donations. And so we started praying, like, Lord, if you want us to go, you're going to have to provide a way. So that, last January, Elizabeth and another leader by the name of Chelsea, who works at Shawnee Mission as well, we decided to talk to the CEO there and just present about the club tell what we were praying for and ask them if there is a way that they could help us go to Oshkosh. So we went, we had the meeting, and he said, you know, at the end of the meeting, he's like, there's a couple I would like you to talk to who comes to mind. Um, let's set up a meeting with them. So we're like, okay. So that was at the end of January, and the meeting was set for March, towards the end of March. Well, the tickets were to be sold out in February. And I was like, okay, Lord, I don't, <laughs> this is, doesn't seem like it's going to work out. And, but we decided to go ahead and keep the meeting. Well, I remember specifically sitting in one of the homes. It was 1030 at night when I got a message on my phone. It said, Oshkosh tickets down to 1600. If you would like any, you need to purchase. They are going to be gone before the weekend's over. And this was the middle of February. And so I called my mom and I'm like, well, I guess that's it. We're not going. And she's like, Anna, you don't know what God has in store. Keep, keep the meeting Keep praying, and even if the tickets sell out, maybe it, once you raise the money for it and other tickets go on sale, you can purchase those. So we decided to keep the meeting in March. And let me tell you, going to a meeting where you are asking for $26,000 and all the tickets are sold out makes you feel not only embarrassed, but it's like, Lord, this I look like a fool. We look like a fool sitting at the table saying, by the way, could you help sponsor our club to an event that there's no tickets actually available to go to? <laughs> and just so you know, it's about $26,000 in order to help us go. But you know what? We serve a living, breathing God. And where he calls you, he's already working on the people's hearts. And so this couple, here's a story. And they said, give us 24 hours. So 24 hours came and they call, and they're like, we would like to complete the budget for your entire club to be able to go, which would mean 77 people going to Oshkosh. It provided equipment. It provided uniforms. And they said, you know what? In fact, just let us know. If the tickets don't work out, then maybe we can allot the money to something else. And so that was a Thursday. On Friday, Anne talked to the director of Oshkosh and said, hey, Interestingly enough, money has come in to be able to help our club go. Have you heard of any tickets for sale? And he's like, no, I haven't. And he's, um, she started telling him about the club. And he's like, well, why don't you write a proposal and you 
or send in a proposal. It just so happens this coming Monday we're having a meeting to talk about this very issue for the last time because there's some things that have come up with the issue of tickets. But if you can send in the proposal before Monday, we'll try to talk about it. So Monday comes, they get back with us, and they say, give us 48 hours. So 48 hours comes and goes, and they call, and they say, we would like to let you know that we're going to grant your club 77 tickets for you to go to Oshkosh. You know, the significance in all of this is not just because of Oshkosh, but it's the opportunity that it provides for these kids. Every day they go to school where there's drugs offered by friends, offered by teachers that have happened. There's a ton of sickness in their homes. These kids are going to the hospital every day, translating for their parents, translating to pay the bills. Their own parents are using drugs as well to help cope with everything that's going on in life. And what they're surrounded with day by day by day, to have an opportunity to go to Oshkosh, to see that they're a part of something much different, much larger than just ourselves, and a little picture of what heaven will be like when we're all gathered together from all over the world. We prayed as a team together, like, Lord, is this where you want us to spend this much money? There are so many needs here. This seems like so much money to spend for one week. But for what that opportunity could do in their lives and help change and help give them a little bit of a different perspective, that was worth everything. So we decided to proceed. And on August 13, 2019, I was sitting at Oshkosh with a little girl who's from the Congo or Tanzania and another little girl who's from Uganda and some of the kids who are from Nepal. And I was looking around at 78 of us actually that went. And it's like, you are so incredible, Lord. He knows our desires in our hearts. He hears you. He knows what you need. And he just asks you to follow him, to come into a relationship with him, and to walk with him, because he'll guide you. And where he calls you to, he's already working. He's already working on people's hearts. He's already worked on parents' hearts to allow the kids to be a part of it. He's already worked on leaders' hearts in order for any of this to happen. He knows, and he provides. My time is running out, but I'm going to end with one last story that has kind of changed everything for me in this process. So throughout this time of living there and you meet kids and kids introduce you to other kids, the prayer in my heart has been, Lord, open my eyes to see the people in front of me. You died so I could live. Show me how to live. You died so I could live. Show me how to live. So one Saturday, I was sitting in church. I go to a Nepali church that um, just so happens they're allowed to, or the church allows them to rent their space on Saturday. So I go there with them. And during the song service, it's loud and everybody's singing. And the pastor's wife leans over to me and she's, she says something to me. And I couldn't quite hear, but all I heard was DMV. And I'm like, DMV? <laughs> Surely I didn't hear right. So I'm like, again, what did you say? And she says something, and I don't understand what's happening. And then it's like DMV, very clearly. So I'm like, do you need to go to the DMV? And she's like, yes. And I'm thinking like, okay, well, let's talk about it after church, and then we can decide when we're going to go and what needs to happen. And she's like, no, we need to go right now. And she points to her sister-in-law, who apparently for a year had been going to this place let me pause here. When refugees come into the United States, since they're not speaking the language, there's driving classes they can go to. So then they teach them how to drive, and with that certificate, they can go and get their license. So she had been trying to get the certificate to show that she had been a part of this class for a year and could go get her license. And so she said, she's been trying to go for a long time, or for a year, and the office is open today. We need to go. So in my mind, with everything happening, I'm like, Lord, I've been praying that you help me to do according to your plan and not my own. But during church, this maybe I need to set some boundaries. Like, this is getting to be too much. And then I was thinking, like, and the DMV, like, we can go on another day. And so I start to say something like, can we plan it for another time? And she's just shaking her head and with the music going. And there's just no way to communicate what I'm thinking. So I'm like, Lord, if I'm making a mistake please, please help in all this. I don't know what to do. So I'm like, okay, let's go. So as we're driving there, the whole story comes out of how frustrating this process has been. She's been trying to go for a year. And I was thinking like, 
No, I don't want to show up and her get the paper and it just speaks to like, oh, this American lady came with me and now they'll listen. Because there's a God in heaven who sees them, who cares, and they can call on Jesus at any time, at any place, dealing in any situation who will show up and provide. And I wanted that message to be sent. And I'm like, me going to get this paper for her is the exact opposite of this message being sent. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do? So then I pull up and I get out of the car and I decide, I'm like, okay, let's just pray before we go in there that Jesus will answer our prayer, that you're able to talk to her and get this paper. So she, we get out, we pray, and I go inside. And after we pray, Father, you know her struggle. Please provide the paper today. We're going into this office, and I remember lots of people all around, and we go into a room, and it's packed with people. So I'm trying to, like, follow her and maneuver through the crowd, and she goes into a room off of that. And we kind of get a little bit separated, and in between us comes a couple towards me. Now, this couple took me by, or I guess it took me off guard, but it, they were clearly from the Middle East. My brother has lived in the Middle East since 2014, and all of a sudden it stopped, and it was like, hi, where are you from? And we started talking, and they said that they were from Syria. They had just gotten here. And they had a little bit of English. They spoke a few words. And I was like, we started sharing a little bit and talking. And she said, do you want to come to my home? I'm like, yes, I would love to. So we exchanged numbers and addresses. So then I leave to go to the office. And out of the office, I see the lady carrying the piece of paper. Jesus answered our prayer. Jesus answered our prayer. She gave me the paper. So we're walking out of the building. And I was so excited because, one, God showed up for her in a personal way, helped her get the paper. And on the way home, I'm like, Lord, you helped me meet this family. What do we do? It just so happens two weeks after that, Michael was going to be, or Michael came home. He was visiting. And I told him about this family, and he's like, let's go. So we went over there one evening. That night, it developed into a friendship immediately, but a friendship that has changed so much for me in my life. These people have words to put to what it's like as a life as a refugee. They're learning English. Sometimes the parents live in silence, and you hear it through the, the stories through the kids. But these parents, every word that they don't know, they're looking up, they're trying to explain, and they have words to put to it. And every time you leave that home, it just feels like everything just stops. And you just have to start praying, like, God, please draw close, because there are things that cannot be answered in this world. There are things that are happening in people's lives that's real pain, real suffering, and real questions that need to be answered. Well, Mary and Elizabeth have gotten to know the mom and invited her to mops. And then the two kids started to join NC for Y, the Pathfinder group. Well, this last camp meeting, we went to the Iowa Missouri camp meeting. We're sitting there. And one night, Philip and I were sitting there. And I look over, and I see Abdullah sitting there, and his head is down. And they're singing about, like, God is so good, a good, good father. And just everybody's praising and worshiping. And I just sat there thinking, Lord, I don't know what he's thinking hearing all of this. What this boy has seen at 17 years old is too much. To see people tortured in front of you, to see, to crawl into your home getting away from bombs, innocent people's lives taken, running for your life, everything that you had taken away. They had a good life in Syria. They had good jobs. Everything was taken. They were forced out of the country only to be told if you come back, you're going to be killed. To live in a refugee camp to where their words were saying they are treated like dogs, not like dogs in the U.S., but dogs overseas. Worse than that. So then, only to come here, and every part of every day is a struggle trying to figure out how to live, trying to figure out what you do, how to survive. And I'm like, how? watching him sit there with his head down, I started praying. Only you can answer these things. Only you can reach his heart. There's nothing we can say to make sense of this world. And after the meeting, I see him walk away, and I remember thinking, like, what are we going to do? Well, later that night, Philip comes to me, and he's like, hey, I talked to Abdullah. And he had gone with him and walked with him. And was like, Abdullah, are you doing okay? And he's like, yeah. He's like, this is just all so strange. He's like, I've never met so many kind people in one place. And then he said, and today, 
our youth group, we went to go pick up trash. Who does that? He's like, I've never seen cleaner grounds anywhere in the world than in the U.S. And we went to go pick up trash. And he's like, it's really weird when I'm hearing all these words. It's like I have peace in my heart. Peace in your heart? Who can do that other than God and God alone? Who can make sense of this world other than God and God alone? There is real pain. And what this boy has been through, it's too much to have answers for. God doesn't cause these things, but I can't wait till heaven when all this is gone. But for right now, what do you say when you look into the face of someone who is suffering and who has suffered? What do you say? But when they can say and look at you in the eyes, I have peace in my heart, you know God's working. And I just want to express to you, what do we say to the world around us who's hurting? Sometimes we don't have answers but we can point to God. Keep pointing to him because God does have answers. He does bring peace that passes understanding. And he can use us, each one of us. I'm going to end on this last thing and then just pray. In Ministry of Healing, it said, Christ recognized no distinction of nationality, of rank, or creed. The scribes and Pharisees desired to make a local and national benefit of the gifts of heaven and to exclude the rest of God's family in the world. But Christ came to break down every wall of partition. He came to show that his gift of mercy and love is unconfined as the air, as the light, or the showers of rain that refresh the earth. The life of Christ established a religion in which there is no caste, a religion by which Jew and Gentile, free and bond, are linked in a common brotherhood equal before God. No question of policy influenced his movements. He made no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. That which appealed to his heart was a soul thirsting for the waters of life. He passed by no human being as worthless, but sought to apply the healing remedy to every soul. And whatever company he found himself, he presented a lesson appropriate to the time and to the circumstances. There's people all around us who are in different circumstances in life, who are hurting. And my prayer is for you, that you will be able to have a front row seat to the God in heaven and see him work in a real and powerful way, because serving him is that. Serving him is sitting in the front row, watching him provide at just the right time and when you need it most. He's alive, he's living, and he's breathing, and he's calling each one of us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for who you are. Thank you for showing up in such a real way in each of our lives. Help us to live for you and you alone. And open our eyes to see others around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Children, we need your help. Come quickly and take up the Lamb's offering. We have a story for you. Thank you, Miss Donna. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. 
All right, were you guys listening to Miss Anna's stories about helping and how God uses people and how God has used her and brought people to help? Did you guys know you're not too young to help too? And I was trying to think when Pastor Mike told me what the, the story was and what he was trying to, to share and what was happening. And I prayed and I prayed, and okay, God, how can I find a story to help these kids remember it doesn't matter how old you are, God can use you. And you know what? I spent a long time looking, and I could not come up with a thing until just when I was laying down last night, and I remembered one of my very favorite stories when I was little. My mom used to read this book to me, and it is about, we don't know her name. We call her the little maid. She was taken as a slave away from her home, away from her mommy and daddy when she was Oh, we don't really know, actually. I'm going to kind of guess maybe eight or nine. She was taken to a whole other country and asked to be a maid for the captain of the enemy's army. And you know what she did? did she, she probably cried and was a bit scared, but she decided, you know what? My mommy and my daddy taught me to love Jesus. I'm going to do the things they taught me to do. And so when little maid was asked to make the beds or clean in the kitchen or help make the food, little maid did it. And she didn't do it complaining. She did everything she was asked to do. And you know what? The captain of the army and his wife, Naaman, and we call him Mrs. Naaman, they noticed that, you know, she does everything we ask, and she does it very politely. There's something about her. The one thing that she did not do when they asked her to come worship their idol, she would not do that because that is against what I believe. And Mr. and Mrs. Naaman were very nice, but they kept asking, nope, I'm not going to do it. Well, this went on, we don't know how long. And one day, little maid came in and Mrs. Naaman was crying. And he said, what's wrong, Mrs. Naaman? And he said, Naaman, the captain of the army, has gotten something, a disease that they couldn't cure at that time called leprosy. And little maid said, I know somebody who can cure it because nobody could cure it at that time. I know somebody who can. Go see the prophet Elijah in my home in Israel. And they were really, that they decided, you know what, there's nothing else to lose. So he went. And Captain Naaman went down and he drew near to the house of, of the prophet. And you know what? The prophet didn't even come out. He sent his servant. And he told him, I need you to go wash yourself in the River Jordan. And he said, what? That is the muddiest, yuckiest river I have ever seen. And you want me to wash in that? No. And he said, nope, I'm not doing it. And he went home and he, he was leaving. And his men would it hurt for you to try? <sighs> That's what I imagine him saying. All right, we'll try. So he got in the river, and he went down. Yeah. And he did down the first time, and he came back up. Yeah. And the spots of leprosy were still there. Yeah. And then he went down a second time, and he went down a third and fourth and fifth and sixth time, and still he had the leprosy. And he went down the seventh time and came back up. And what happened? Do you guys know? His leprosy was gone. You're right. And he was so excited and so happy. He and his men, they got back on, and they ran, raced back to, to the prophet's house to thank him. And you know what the prophet said? It wasn't me who did it. It was God. Do you think that, that Naaman would have been able to be healed? If he hadn't listened to Little Maid, do you know? I I think that after he, I, I believe the Bible tells us that Naaman and his Mrs. Naaman worshipped God after that. If Miss, if Little Maid hadn't been willing to do exactly what Jesus asked her to do, to follow God no matter what, and to be to be helpful, and do the just be who He asked her to be, I don't know that Mr. and Mrs. Naaman would be willing to listen. But because she was, because she was doing what God asked her to do and be the kind of, of person God asked her to be, 
no matter where she was, around whoever she was, they were able to have a relationship with God. And one of the important people of that country learned about who God really is. You guys aren't too young. Every time you obey your parents, every time you guys are out and you are at the store and somebody sees you obeying your parents or you're helpful, that they drop something, you pick it up, do you know that shows them Jesus? Just by doing simple things. If you smile at somebody, that can help their whole day, and that shows them Jesus. So I just wanted to remind you that it doesn't matter how old you are, wherever you are, you can show them Jesus. Let's have prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for each of these children. You know their hearts, and you know the plans you have for them. Please continue to guide and direct them and keep them coming to you so that they can be a good reflection of you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may walk quietly back to your seats. Becky and I had the privilege of getting to teach Anna in first grade at Sunnydale Elementary School. And after listening to her today, I can just say, what has God wrought? Um, the offering today is for church budget. And as I was listening to Anna talk today, it just reminded me that the church budget, yes, it's about the lights and the heat and all that stuff. But what it's really about is ministry. What it's really about are things like mops, like pathfinders, like adventurers, like Sabbath school, like outreach to our community, like allowing us to provide parking space for the high school for events that they have. Those kinds of things that are reaching out to our community. So as our, as our deacons come forward today, let's remember that this is about ministry and this is about ministry for Chapel Oaks. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for the Sabbath and thank you for the ministries that happen in this church. Thank you for the ministries that um, Anna is leading out with, with, with the Nepalese and with other refugees from all over the world. Lord, we ask that you will help us to be supportive of that and help us to be supportive of reaching out to our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before we pray, I'd like you to reflect on something with me. Jesus, priorities for life. Up, in, 
out. Up, close connection with God. Now follow this with me. You remember in Anna's testimony, a deep prayer of surrender took place. Do you remember that? That's a daily experience for a Christian. And two things are happening when we pray like that. We yield ourselves to God, and through that same prayer, life from God flows into our life. The second thing, in. Did you notice in Anna's story, it was fellow believers, fellow Christians that nudged her and supported her in the ministry that God was calling her to. That's how God works. Not individual atoms doing our own thing out here, but we're connected with other people in the body. And then I'd like you to remember one more piece that really impressed me in the testimony. What would have happened if she never knocked on that first door, even though she didn't know what she was going to do or to say? What if she wouldn't have knocked on that door? I hate to even think about that, but she did. She reached out. It's not really complicated what Jesus is calling us to, but it does take a choice. Will you make a choice with me to live that way? Up, in, out. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are real. You're a personal God, a living God. Thank you for this gift of prayer through which we can connect with you and through which your very life, the life of Jesus, through the Spirit, flows into our life and out to others. Lord, we long to be the fulfillment of what Micah saw, that the remnant of Israel, your people, us, would be in the midst of many people as a refreshing dew from the Lord. Lead us to that experience. Bind us closely together, heart to heart, to support and encourage each other in ministry. And please grant us the boldness, but also, Lord, help us to make the decision each day to reach out beyond our comfort zone. Thank you for what you've done for Anna and the people that you're ministering to through her. Please continue in Jesus' name. Amen.